So I'm, I'm going to start with a quote, which is that democracy, um, when propaganda is to democracy, as violence is to a dictatorship. And I think that is an, an incredibly important idea that we understand. For all sorts of historical reasons in countries like this one, it's simply not possible for the authorities to, to use force at the first sign of, of protest and you know, disappear people. There are many parts of the world where people protest and the consequences are that they do disappear and end up dead in a ditch somewhere. We're beyond that in, in countries like this one, and that's a very good thing. But it does mean that we really, really need to wake up to the power that people like Rupert Murdoch have to shape our sense of what reality is. That is what we're talking about. We're not just talking about individual issues that Rupert Murdoch might have a right-wing view on, even though that is a major problem. It is the ability of these five right-wing billionaires and the corporate money that pays for their media outlets to dictate our sense of what is possible in this world. And so we live in a situation which, if, if any Martian were to sort of come, come down to Earth, would be seen as utterly insane. We have, I mean, and this is the Ecology Day, so it's worth mentioning this. In the last couple of years, we've had the World Bank, we've had the International Energy Agency, and we've had PricewaterhouseCoopers, the giant evil cartel accountancy firm, all agree with the scientific consensus on climate change that we are headed to potentially the collapse of human civilization. As one of the most prominent climate scientists, when asked about the difference between two degrees of warming and four degrees of warming, and by the way, four degrees is the difference in temperature between the last ice age and where we are now, the climate scientists answered the difference between two and four is human civilization. So we're in a situation where these very mainstream bodies like the World Bank, like the International Energy Agency, there are certainly no friends to liberal protesters like myself, saying that we are headed towards the collapse of human civilization unless we turn things around incredibly quickly. But nonetheless, we all go through our lives as if things are basically okay. And, and that just getting on with things, trying to keep our own heads above water is sufficient. And I would suggest to you that one of the major factors in that is the fact that we don't have the imminent collapse of human civilization on the front pages all the time. And why is that? It's because people like Rupert Murdoch have massive investments in fracking companies, for instance, in other fossil fuel interests, in other economic interests that are incre incredibly profitable at the moment, despite the fact that the consequences to the majority of people George. of incredible concentration of wealth and power in a few hands are increasingly bad. In a world with us unprecedented food production, for instance, we still have a couple of billion people that do not have enough to eat. Um, in a world of unprecedented medical know-how, we still have a billion people that suffer often, you know, often with their lives because they don't have access to basic medicine. So how is it that this, this insane reality that the vast majority of people in every single country that you would visit would not want to be the reality? How is it that this goes on as if it's kind of okay? And the answer I would suggest is a huge amount to do with people like Rupert Murdoch and the fact that they control what our sense of possibility is. Um, you probably heard today though there are five right, very much right-wing billionaires that control 80% of our media. Um, it's often been said that, that democracy is ruled by the people based on informed consent. That is incredibly crucial for very, very obvious reasons, right? If we are making our political decisions based on a distorted version of reality, then we can't be said in any meaningful way to be exercising free choice. So this is a huge, huge problem that we have, and that's why we're here this week to try and draw attention to it. Um, one of the things, one of the, the, the sort of insane parts of the reality that is presented as normal, and in fact not only as normal, as the only, the only thing that's possible, is the current economic system. And as everybody knows, that current economic system is concentrating wealth at incredible speed. And what that means, of course, is it's, in, it's concentrating political power at extraordinary speed. And that concentration of political power leads to concentration of wealth, leads to concentration of political power, etc. It's a vicious circle. And we're set, um, literally in the next 12 months, we're set for a situation where the richest 1% in the world have the same wealth as the other 99% combined. So for anyone that accepts that we do have some environmental, you know, materially rich lives for a lot of them, 
we do need to think quite seriously about how we use the world's resources to have half the world's resources essentially concentrated in 1% of hands so the other 99% have to feed you know, have to provide for their needs with the other half that is the most insanely inefficient thing you could possibly imagine and, and the irony is that this system sells itself as you know maybe not particularly fair but competitive and inefficient in fact it is absolutely the opposite we have incredibly destructive inefficient industrial processes to the point where 95% of the things we buy are thrown away six months later around the world. That is an extraordinary fact. And in many cases, that's because of what they call planned obsolescence. Like, if you're a large company, you want to sell as many things as possible. If there aren't rules about the, the way that you make stuff and the consequences of making stuff, then not surprisingly, you're going to try and make stuff in a way that means that people have to buy more of that stuff very soon. And like a lot of things that are happening in the world at the moment, it's not about some devilish conspiracy at every step. It's just about a logic of the system that is having awful consequences. Um, and, you know, I mentioned the incredible inefficiency. Of course, what this means also is you get very, very little competition for a system that sells itself as competitive. What you, in fact, have in, in virtually every sphere is cartels dominating. You know, a cartel is a group of huge companies that essentially stitch up a market so they can keep the prices up, keep their profits increasing, and keep control of that market. Um, and the internet is a very, a very interesting example of this, by the way, in that what started as this, you know, very inspiring platform, free of, uh, free of corporate control, that seemed like an opportunity for, for normal people to be on a level playing field with, you know, the rich and powerful of the world, has increasingly over the last 20, 30 years, or the last 20 years, become dominated essentially by private fiefdoms, by cartels. You know, you have Google, Facebook. The, the providers, you know, um, um, Amazon, AOL, etc. Um, and, and as soon as you, the way cartels tend to operate, the reason they can control control these areas is that once you get to a certain level of wealth, power, and control in your industry, it means that you can essentially buy up all the competition. You can go to the small operator and you say, either you sell up to us and you probably don't have to work again, or we will work a way to work out a way to crush you because we have more power. Um, and one of the things that links very, very directly with why we're here today is that um, the vast majority of these huge, um, of huge corporations, including media corporations and definitely including News International, they don't pay tax, or they pay virtually no tax whatsoever. So where the average person, the average business, has to include in their, in their operating costs the need to pay back to the state for all the services that they receive that allow them to run their business, the richest and most powerful don't bother. And one of the most like galling things about our so-called democracy at the moment is a lot of the, the economic forces that pay for our elections, that pay for, for the political parties to be able to operate, don't even pay tax. So instead of paying tax, they pay money to make sure that the laws that, that, that are passed in this country are in the interest of them and not in the interest of the majority. Um, and this leads to what's been called capitalist realism. Um, and, and that's summed up in the one sentence that it's easier, to, it's easier for a lot of us to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of the end of capitalism. Um, I came across interest quite last night. It's John Maynard Keynes, who who is rightly seen in some ways as the architect of what's known as the, the both the golden age of democracy and the golden age of capitalism, which was the post-war period. Um, and there are qualifications there. Keynes was actually in the in the Bretton Woods ag Agreement at the end of the Second World War, was pushing for a much fairer global system that would put the pressure. To, to balance trade on the rich countries where it should be and Britain was actually threatened the, with the withholding of all their all the Marshall Plan money that was what we used to get back on our feet after the war um, we were threatened with that money being withheld if Keynes didn't back off from his more progressive proposals but leaving that aside for a second in the post-war period we did have a much much better system um, and you know what was incredible what was incredibly unusual about that system was economic redistribution for all the, the major successes we've seen from people's movements over the years, from end of slavery to rights of, rights of women, um, it, it was the economic redistribution that happened in the post-war period that was significant, getting the rich to pay 80% tax. And there were holes in that, and, and if, if we want to get back to that, we need to make sure the holes aren't there this time that allowed them to get, get back to where they are now. But that's a bit of a tangent. The, the point was that Keynes, there's a quote attributed to Keynes where he says, Capitalism is the astounding belief that the, nasty, the, the nastiest of systems 
um, run by the nastiest of men on the nastiest of motives will work for the good of all. You know, that is essentially the system that, that we are expecting to deliver a decent future to our children. More and more power concentrated in the hands of those who benefit most from the inequality and unfairness, as if that is somehow magically going to give us the decent, functional, democratic, compassionate world that we all actually believe in. And, and virtually all of us, I mean, the statistics show that, um, I mean, some, some suggest that about 5% of people are perhaps clinically psychopathic. Um, um, but other than those 5% of people, the vast majority of people, as far as they're concerned, they would far rather see a fairer, more decent world, and it's only not happening because of how we're told that other people are. Um, you, you know he's not here, don't you? Yeah. And we're just ordinary workers in yeah, there. That's what we're trying to and we're paying tax as well. We pay exactly. like, all our tax. Who do you yeah, work no, for? We're not here to criticise ordinary workers news. by any means. Like, huh? We're not here to criticise ordinary workers. Neither are we here to try and talk directly to Rupert Murdoch. My personal belief is that he's not. he has no interest really in listening to us. The no, no, but if you went and found him, it would have much more of an effect than and just some, hassling some us. Some processes are, do actually involve sort of hounding people like Rupert Murdoch, and that's one way to do it, but that's not what we're doing here. What we're doing here is trying to get ordinary people to engage with these hugely important questions. And, and crucially, it's not about, for me, this is not about persuading Rupert Murdoch of anything. It's about persuading the majority of people that the power that we have allowed people like Rupert Murdoch to amass is incredibly damaging for the rest of us. Um, that, that being as it is, we're only trying to make a living. Oh no, absolutely, and, and if you read our safest wages policy and heard what we said earlier, we're definitely not trying to criticise the average person, it's just trying to make a living. Um, yeah, and, and why, do, why, do, why do we not have a movement to make sure that workers own businesses? You know, if we believe in democracy, we have this word occupation that we use to refer to what most of us spend most of our time doing, most of our time doing and we take granted that when we step into our occupation, i.e. most of our lives, we live in entirely hierarchical environments where we essentially have to do what we're told by the person above, we have no say in what happens overall, and of course what that's meant for the British economy is disastrous. If you compare, I mean Germany is by no means perfect, but if you compare where Germany is at and where Britain is at at the moment, um, one of the big differences is that German workers have representation on the boards of their companies and the, on the boards of their local banks. So when it came to making decisions in the last 30 years about what should happen to their businesses, funnily enough those German workers didn't turn around and say, yes, why don't we close down our factory in Germany and move it to China where people can be exploited in unimaginable ways um, and you know, driven off their land into horrible situations. Um, people made decisions that were in the, inter in the interest of their communities and in the interest of their businesses, and sure enough the German economy is in a lot healthier state than the British economy. So a lot of this stuff is just about, it's not about the, just the right thing in some moral sense, it's about the fact that what is the right thing in a moral sense is, a right, is the right thing in a practical sense. If we believe in democracy, why not have democracy in the workplace? And then people are far more likely to make responsible decisions in terms of what affects workers and their local environment. Um, I, 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 I could go on, are there any, are there any questions at this point? Because I, I do have a tendency to, to rant for as long as, I, for as, long as I'm able. Does anyone have any questions? So, a lot of people, a, a lot of people who, who buy into the idea that kind of, okay, the press isn't perfect, but you know, we basically have a free press. You know, look at China, look at Russia, it could be worse. I think um, the, the argument that people often give is, well, you know, look at our media. You have the Guardian, that's you know, that's relatively progressive. There are some journalists that you know that criticise corporate power, etc. Doesn't that mean we have a free press? The answer is no. What advertisers know very well is that this is not about what what is there somewhere in a very small percentage, maybe on page 15, that if you already have the inclination to look for it, you'll find. It's about what is put in front of people most often. Um, it's a cliche of the of the marketing world that you need people to hear something. You'll hear, hear something, you'll see something five times over before they react to it. Um, Luke, Luke my group's everywhere, that's still roughly accurate. Um, but that's really the point. It's the stories we get told over and over and over about what's possible that dictate our sense of what we can actually achieve. And, and what the movement that I'm part of, the Occupy movement, and what this week is about, is getting people to believe that we can have a, a decent, sane world where we share the world's resources in a reasonably a reasonably fair way, so we all get what we need, so we all have 
food, water, shelter, and a bit more to, to pursue our dreams. That that is not an unreasonable, not an unreasonable thing to to dream of in the world that we have at the moment. Through technology, both in terms of industry, in terms of communication technologies, um, also in terms of the ecological thing, our ability to understand how damaging what we do at the moment is and how nature does things so much better. We are in a position to copy that like never before. We are in a position to create a decent, fair world like never before. Um, and the only thing that stands in, a way, in our way is roughly, I mean, we talk about the 1% of the Occupy movement, but realistically, we're talking about 0.001 really. You know, you can be you can be in the one percent if you happen to have a house in London that's got the value has gone up from three hundred thousand to a million because of where you happen to live um, in the last ten years. It's really the the sixty seven the six sorry sixty six richest people in the world that have the same wealth as the bottom half of the world that are the problem. And that's that is a statistic that bears repeating. It's from Forbes, which is a magazine for the rich. This is not some sort of um, lefty statistic. Literally 66 people have the same wealth as three and a half billion people. So if our dream is democracy in the world, then clearly that incredible concentration of wealth and power is something that we have to deal with. Um, and in terms of our politics, again, I, I think I certainly grew up with this, this very sort of clever nationalistic tendency to look at what happens in this country and compare it to what happens somewhere else. So, so the argument that we often use to defend the status quo, however bad it is, is that it, it, it's worse in other places. Um, but I think that's a huge, huge diversion. You know, yes, things could actually could be a lot worse than, than they are in this country for a lot of people, um, but they are still incredibly bad and nowhere near approaching democracy. And that can be seen really clearly in the fact that on all sorts of issues, opinion polls show categorically that the majority of people, even on, on the, the what people think of as the left and the right, think that a certain thing should happen and none of the mainstream parties offer that as a policy. So the majority of UKIP and Tory voters, let alone Lib Dems and Labour and, and Undecided, believe that we should renationalise our energy system and renationalise the railways. So actually because people as, as a whole are pretty rational and they realise that both in terms of energy and in terms of travelling by train, they are being absolutely fleeced by a handful of companies that have what are essentially artificial monopolies now and can charge what they like in order to maximise returns to shareholders. Um, but as I say, none of the main parties is offering that as an option. And so what you have in, in the political sense is, is a, an incentive for a downward spiral of, of confidence in the system, which means that more and more people don't actually engage with it. Um, and I think that is our greatest danger. The, the more corrupt the system becomes, the less we feel inspired to actually do something about it, and therefore the system becomes more corrupt, and you know the cycle goes on. Um, but most changes in history, major changes in history, don't happen gradually. They happen because of tipping points, critical masses, critical junctures, i.e., points at which the mass, the mass awareness in private becomes public in some way and I think I think that's what we really need to hold on to. It's not that the majority of people buy into the idea that Rupert Murdoch should be running our country and the world. Um, it's just that the storyline about how and why that happens and how there are really decent sensible democratic alternatives is not presented in the mainstream so people hold that view in private and it's when movements like Occupy a few years ago come up that gives the majority of people a chance to actually engage publicly with those views and not feel so isolated and start to believe in the possibility of change. Um, and most critical masses for change when the cause is just uh, involve a very small percentage of people between, you know, depending on the studies you, you read, between 1% and, so, and 7% usually are required to be, you know, actually engaged for something to change. And I think the reason is we are basically decent, compassionate beings. We are, we are highly adaptable, so in certain circumstances we will absolutely focus on me and mine, um, because obviously that's really important for, for survival, but our physiology, the way our brains work, everything about what it is to be a human being says that the best situation for us individually and collectively is to be in a situation of mutual benefit, where we have what we need and we know that other people will have that, what they need as well, so we become much less insecure about what we have, much less guilty about what we have, and that's, that's a situation that benefits everybody. Um, and, and we have, I mean, to be vaguely technical for a second, we have what neurophysiologists call mirror neurons or empathy neurons. Whether they're in fact individual neurons or part of a, a system is, is up for debate. But we basically 
see the experience of others as if it were our own. So when people are suffering, we suffer. Um, so we all benefit from a decent world. What happened with the Occupy movement the first time round is that despite three years of crisis, um, most of what was being talked about in the public was getting the deficit down. We had three months of the Occupy movement outside St. Paul's, outside Wall Street in New York, across the world, and suddenly in the mainstream we were talking about massive inequality. We were talking about the fact that $20 trillion is in tax havens and therefore unavailable to governments to provide the things that people need. Um, we were talking about the power of banks over our economy. Um, and that, I think, is what we need to hold on to. It's that things can change very, very quickly, and they generally change because enough normal people start believing in their voice and remembering their collective power. And, and I think one of the greatest evils of, of News International um, is the way it frames us as individuals. And it frames us as individuals very much within a kind of divide and rule narrative. Um, so it totally takes away any sense we might have of collective power, because if there's no story about you know being part of a collective citizenry, if all we ever hear is that we're individual consumers, then it's pretty much inconceivable, it's beyond the boundaries of the way most people think, to imagine that millions of us could get together and actually demand the change we need to see. Um, what also comes with that individualization is the same divide and rule, just in different modern clothes that we've had you know, going back to the Roman Empire. Um, the way power has always worked is to try and split the normal people whose interests are in fact generally aligned to split them against each other so they don't get together and focus their attention and energy on the people right at the top whose interests are not aligned with the, with the vast majority because the people right at the top benefit enormously from the fact that um, the vast majority don't have control of power so that they can have that control of power. Um, and you know, need, you know, you need to pick up any, pretty much any single day of the week, pick up the sun, pick up the times, you have these basically like racist, classist, divisive narratives um, that blame this enormous financial crisis in effect on the poor. You know, the reason we have a, a problem with the economy is because of the poor, um, which is again like so many things when you step back from it, it's totally nonsensical. Um, the bottom 50% in this country have about 5% of the wealth. Bottom 50%, 5% of the wealth. Um, but nonetheless, all this stuff is made to seem normal. and, and in a sense, it's not, it's not even that this stuff is made to, made to seem normal, it's just kept out of the equation. What is made to seem normal is the idea that the reason we have problems is because immigrants are coming from Eastern Europe or because people who are out of work are claiming benefits. And, and is it a word on the benefits thing, by the way? Um, successive intentional government policy since Thatcher has focused our economy away from nationwide industrialization into concentrating all, most of our economic activity around the city of London um, and the, the payoff if you like which was which was never something that we agreed to democratically was that the people who were put out of work in their millions across the country would, would then at least have some social safety net to support them what the, the latest crisis has been used to do is to, is to demonize those very people whose jobs were taken away by decisions that were out of their hands um, Yeah, and, and apart from the fact that, that, that if, if you look at the, the um, opinion polls on this stuff, there is complete delusion in terms of what the actual reality is on the ground. The, vast, the majority of people think that about 40% of government spending is going to unemployment benefits. The reality is, is it's something like specifically unemployment benefits is 4% of the benefit bill. Um, the, the majority of, of benefits are actually going to housing benefit and to benefits for the working poor. Because the rich have concentrated so much wealth and power, people down the chain don't even get paid enough, even if they're working full time, they're doing everything they're meant to do, to live a, a vaguely decent life. And so by selling off all the council houses, for instance, as well, you then have, is it, I think, I mean, look this up for yourself because I'm not entirely sure of the figure, but I think it's about 70 billion pounds a year is going into the hands of private landlords um, through housing benefit which is a crazy, crazy inefficiency again. And, and this is because it is against the law for councils to build houses. You know, we know in every single place in the country there are plenty of people, plenty of people who want to live in, in affordable accommodation, that are able to pay reasonable rents, that would certainly more than cover the cost of building that housing in the first place. But the law has been changed to prevent councils from doing that so that you can have this enormous transfer of wealth into the hands of very, very few people. And the returns in the last 15 years for, for private landlords have been around about 
So that's an insane, insane return on investment. And, and housing, by the way, is one of the main means by which the divide between rich and poor is, is increasing. Um, and especially in London, as the, the markets become more and more fictitious because we've created all this, this fake money through quantitative easing, and instead of using it to actually stimulate the economy in a better way, just giving it to banks, um, what that has done is made the, the value of shares go up enormously, not because the companies are worth any more than they were before, but because there's just much more money sloshing around the casino, people have bid the prices up. Um, so, yeah, so. London property, lost my train slightly. London property, therefore, is seen as a safe asset because the, the one, the point one percent know that the market is going to crash enormously at some point. So having their having their assets tied up in things like property, that when the, the markets collapse, become a safe haven for investment, is what's been going on in London, and that's why the vast majority of people on on basic wages can't even afford to pay their rent even when they're working full time. So I, I guess to sum up, we live in it in an insane situation where we are on the point of destroying the world for, for all foreseeable generations, not to mention wiping out half the species on the planet in the next century. We live in a situation where 1% um, have the same wealth as the other 99%, and we see this as basically normal. Um, Margaret Thatcher said there's no alternative, and what the media system, especially run by Rupert Murdoch, who's had extraordinary influence over individual politicians and political parties, achieves, is the normalization of that crazy reality. There's a, a guy called Eric Sprom, who I'd hugely, hugely recommend if people haven't come across him. Um, he wrote an amazing book called The Art of Loving, which is the first one I read, so I highly recommend that, but he writes amazing stuff about, about politics, and he came up with the term, the pathology of normalcy. It is basically, it's one of our greatest assets as human beings is our adaptability. It's that we can basically get on in any situation, however bad it is. But the flip side of that is that we tend to treat whatever situation we find ourselves in as normal. Even when stepping back from it, our rational brains can understand that there is nothing remotely normal about the crazy, crazy point in history, in history we find ourselves at at the moment. Um, so what we need to do is use the, the incredible potential of the internet at the moment to inform each other. We need to remember the lessons of the past, which is that things change enormously when large numbers of people get together and voice their concerns together. Because the little people only have power in so much as they work together. They don't have the billions that they can use to, to pull the strings at the top. Um, but the lesson of history time and time again is that when people unify, when they push forward with perseverance and conviction with a just cause, if they stick at it, they will win. You know, Gandhi said, first they ignore you, then they ridicule you. Eventually, they have to listen to you. Um, so I, I'll stop there. We've got, I think, at least half an hour for the general questions and chat. But thank you very much for One thing I haven't really mentioned, and I think it's partly because we're framing this as, as on kind of the media billionaires, because we do have a huge issue with ownership, full stop, in terms of media. Um, but one thing I haven't mentioned is advertising. And, and in terms of what I've called this talk, I, I think it's something to do with reclaiming our dreams, and that might sound airy-fairy, but a huge problem we have is that three trillion dollars a year, roughly, so that's about three thousand billion dollars a year are spent across the world messing with our hearts and minds. That's the money we spend on public relations, marketing, and advertising. That money is spent to, to manipulate us at increasingly sophisticated, unconscious levels, to make sure that we are behaving in the ways that the corporations want us to behave and not in the way that aligns with our conscious interests. Um, and so the effect of advertising in virtually every media context is enormous. And the effect of advertising, by the way, on the BBC is enormous as well, because the BBC, in order to, in order to portray itself as neutral, essentially just aligns itself with the norms of the rest of the media, which is dominated by corporate money. Um, so advertising is an, an enormous, enormous problem. And there is a solution to this, and it's pretty simple. It's recognizing that a, me that a, a free and independent media is crucial to any functioning democracy, and therefore it's something we should invest in as a democracy. And like virtually all the other things that we know we really need that we've been told there's no money for, if we bring the elephant, if we expose the elephant in the room, which is that 1% have 50% of the wealth, there is plenty of money to do all these things that are necessary, whether it's providing benefits to old and disabled people, having functioning hospitals, um, or 
paying for a decent independent media. Um, you know, there are all sorts of sensible proposals. You could give people, every citizen in the country, £200 each year that they can allocate to any non-commercial media source. Um, and there's no reason why you could do that. The, the cost of that relative to what we spend on wars and bank bailouts and all the rest of it is negligible. Um, there is no reason why we couldn't do that and that would transform our press overnight. Um, so it is entirely possible to have a decent independent press to change the laws which make it impossible for you know, the likes of Rupert Murdoch to own this vast share of, of the media that they have. All of this stuff is entirely possible, but it's only going to happen if we make it happen. Um, thank you. Outside support in the city of London. What we've been doing since October last year is turning up monthly in Parliament Square to bring that same narrative about the incredible corruption in countries like this one, to bring that narrative to the institutions in Westminster that facilitate all that corruption. And that is an incredibly important link to make. Because um, people who have heard me speak probably may have made this reference before, but has anyone, who's seen, has anyone, has anyone seen Aladdin, the movie? I haven't seen Aladdin. Not, not to endorse Disney, because Disney is part from it. Um, I haven't seen Aladdin. At the very end of the movie in Aladdin, the, the trick that Aladdin comes up with to, to, to defeat the, the all-powerful uh, the all-powerful all sorcerer is to persuade the all-powerful sorcerer that the most powerful thing to be is an all-powerful genie. And what that means is that Aladdin, basically by getting the lamp and rubbing it, can get the genie back in the lamp. We have exactly the same power over our corporations and our banks and everything else. There is nothing constitutionally to prevent us going to the polls in May and through that choosing a party like the Green Party who is not, fund not funded by corporations that has a commitment to re-democratising the money supply, to reforming the media, to transforming our economy so that it's one that benefits people consistently and is not going to destroy our, our children and all future generations in the process. There is nothing to prevent us doing that in terms of our formal constitution. So we get to rub the lamp. Corporations only have the power they do because of this reality control that the media is, is at the forefront of. If, if our sense of possibility can open, our sense of the horizons of what we can achieve move to that point, we realise we can rein in the corporations, we can create this world.